Okay, so the last presentation um, for the day we saved for last, partially because this is a bit of a, I think, just an interesting, fun, different kind of a topic. And we thought we could squeeze it in this council meeting. And it's something I've been meaning to want to have a presentation about probably for a better part of a year. We want to pick the right council meeting where this seemed like an appropriate time to do it. And we thought that was the present. But to really, really understand this, I want to set a context because there's a bit of a storyline associated with this. I guess the first thing I'd say is uh, maybe I take some of what you're going to hear about um, uh, personally or a little bit of ownership around this because of my strong devotion to the field of genomics with the field getting named and coming to be literally the year I graduated medical school and graduate school. I grew up, you know, as a postdoc in the Human Genome Project. And I just think there was this, it was just a, it's a remarkable field that I'm incredibly proud of, as I know all of you are. So I just think it's really important for us to think about how young the discipline is and how there's a lot of a lot of really interesting things that unfolded at this institute that, that shaped uh, this, um, this important field of genomics. And meanwhile, when I came to the institute even 24 years ago or 23 years ago, and, and, uh, and even as an intramural investigator, I was reasonably impressed with how the institute seemed committed to trying to capture a lot of the things that were going on. I, you know, we had a, a, a staff photographer. We did a lot of videotaping of stuff even back then. And there was just a lot of things and a lot of workshops and a lot of documents coming out of workshops. And it just seemed like there was lots of remarkably uh, valuable materials that were being accumulated at the Institute. So I was impressed with that. But, I, but the, this, this real story begins um, in September of 2008, literally when I got a phone call. And the phone, uh, true story, the phone call I got was from Francis. I was the intramural director. Francis was about to leave the institute like in a week. Uh, and it was his last week as NHGRI director. And he called me and he said, you know, I'm cleaning out my office and I'm uncovering a whole, I, I have to leave all documents behind. That's sort of a rule in the government. You can't take everything. He goes, and I'm just coming up with all sorts of really cool notes of mine and summaries and things you know, from the Bermuda meetings and things that are really, really valuable. And I'm, I'm actually don't want to just leave them behind. So I'm thinking maybe I should copy them or do something. And he, and he sort of said, and I looked around, you know, we, I, we have a copier over here, but it's not a particularly great one. And, and he, he, he knew that I had in the intramural scientific director office, we had just purchased a, a reasonably high throughput scanner for getting ready for site visits and various things like that. And he sort of said, do you think maybe we should be scanning some of this? I said, that's a good idea. I said, look, put, make a pile of the stuff you think is the most valuable, and I'll send somebody over, and we'll at least get this stuff scanned, because he couldn't take any of it. True story. That, once he scanned, we started scanning a bunch of stuff, and then we put together a bunch of CDs. This is actually one of them. I had about six or seven copies, gave him one. I kept one. I forgot what we did with a bunch. We said, at least this is Francis's most precious stuff as he's literally walking out the door. So, so that's the beginning of the story. But one thing I remember thinking is that, you know, genomics deserves better than this. You know, this is ridiculous. And, you know, it's just to have some CD that a last second was thought about, you know, and, and Francis was sitting on a treasure trove of his immediate notes that he kept in his immediate office. Turns out that was just the tip of the iceberg, right? Because what happens? If you fast forward from September 2008 until December 1 of 2009, at that point, he's bungee cord back to the NIH as the NIH director, and meanwhile, I applied for and got appointed to be the NHGRI director. And December 1st, I took over his old office. And I walked into his office and found drawers filled with the stuff that he never got to, right? Because he only could get to what he, like in the last couple of hours on the job. And they were just incredibly rich files of really cool stuff. But that, that was just the start of it. I mean, by the way, there are boxes in the corner that you open up. Every box you open up is another famous workshop, another interesting thing, videotapes, audio, tape, all sorts of things. And that was just the tip of the iceberg. Because then we decide, well, we actually need to renovate the suite. So you start packing up old offices that various people use. And there's just abandoned files and, and, and things that are of great historic value. And they're all getting boxed up. And, oh, by the way, we also then have, had, and we also had issues with people starting to retire, think, and, and all of a sudden their offices are getting boxed up. Oh, and then, by the way, we realized that we had a really nice computer server where lots of stuff was put into shared folders, but we really needed to reorganize, and there was just stuff everywhere. And um, this really worried, started to worry me. Um, and then what I should tell you, and you have to appreciate, is as boxes start getting moved around, the government has a lot of rules 
associated with official government documents. Every one of these pieces of paper are official government documents. You can't just do anything you want with them. Uh, these things have to eventually be formally archived and eventually find their ways into find their way into into um, uh, sort of big archives that look like the last scene of the Indiana Jones and Temple of, uh, Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom movie, right? And then forever they're lost. And I just kept, again, I kept thinking, you know, I'm so worried. And, and people started coming to me going, we got to do something about these boxes. They got to be moved. They got to be archived or over. And I was worried we'd lose track of some of this stuff. So uh, faced with all of that, and it just kept coming, barrages, I, I, I turned to Chris Wetterstrad, actually. I said, as somebody who especially was uh, now working in a role of liaison to the extramural program and having a lot of history at the Institute, I said, what are we going to do? We got to do something. And so Chris and I started figuring out things that she could do to try to gather stuff and organize stuff. And it became very apparent very quickly that she was in over her head. I was in over my head. This was just a, a Herculean task. And we were up against actually some deadlines with respect, with respect to literally rooms filled with boxes accumulated from staff that were important as far as I was concerned. And yet these were going to have to go off to government archives if we didn't get our house more in order. And so I said, you know, we're, we, you know, we really need some help. You look around NIH. The truth is NIH doesn't do this very well. There are pockets of NIH. Intellectual Library of Medicine does some stuff. But if you look at most institutes, most institutes I mean, they just don't have infrastructure for this, particularly strong. And the little bit of infrastructure there is, every time there's a budget cut, sort of it gets, it gets made smaller. And so it's, and it's just not campus-wide. You had to solve, we had to solve this problem ourselves. And so I uh, said, we should hire somebody who actually knows what they're doing, a professional who actually knows how to archive and knows how to sort of take advantage of modern technologies to, to get all of this, these, I think, valuable um, assets in a form that, that would be safe and also in a form that could be utilized uh, for people who like to study these things and want to sort of have a good accounting of the history of the field and of the institute, both of which I thought deserve something better than, than a government archive. Um, and so through a really just somebody who knew somebody and a, and a little bit of luck, uh, we identified, uh, I'm not even sure it was a doctor then, Chris Donahue was just finishing his doctorate um, in the history of science at the University of Maryland. And uh, a, he fit the bill, somebody who was, had expertise and was energetic and thought what we had in our collection was incredibly cool. And so I hired Chris, and uh, no pun intended, but the rest is history, um, and just said, you own this. You, you tell us how to do this, and I think this would be a very exciting opportunity for you not only to create a strong infrastructure for us to not lose this stuff, but also to do scholarly work around this and, um, and stimulate scholarly work around this. Now, I would say that, and so he's going to tell you about what he's accomplished since coming to the Institute. Um, you know, it, I'll be candid, it's, it's, this is somewhat unprecedented. Most other institutes haven't done something like this, but what the hell? You know, that's what we do all the time at NHGRI. We do things that are unprecedented, and, um, and uh, it, it has served us well. And so I think it's, a, it's with that spirit that we decided to, to create an internal history program, history of genomics program. Chris Donahue leads. That's what he's going to summarize for you. And, and really, I think what I'm doing um, in, in bringing this to council, there's really two things. One, I wanted you to be aware of this. And you may even be interested. You may know people who are interested in, 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 in accessing some of these materials we've put together, because that's why we have them organized. But also, we'd be very receptive to your feedback, uh, because, you know, again, being so unprecedented, there's lots of ideas of things we might do or might not want to do. It's still a very young um, um, program, and it's, and, and it's sort of out there uh, without much precedent to sort of guide its, uh, its future. So with that as a context, I'll turn this over to Chris. Well, thank you, Eric. Um, all right, so to begin, this is really what we started with. This is not an actual picture, but it's a good representation. And as, as Eric said, if we did nothing, um, they would, uh, the files would have gone into sort of the gray box of the, of the National Archives. So we embarked on a flurry of digitization from 2012 to 2013. And this would enable us to keep really a copy of our history, a copy of the files. And at the same time, we really began thinking about the various ways to capture the history of the Institute. So even beyond digitization, beyond capturing, we were uh, really thinking about uh, starting an oral history 
effort, uh, other ideas were proposed, and in 2014, the History of Genomics program was actually born. So the program has three goals around uh, which this uh, talk is designed. The first is uh, getting the NHGRI organized. And here I'll describe how we succeeded in capturing the rich history of the HGP genomics and the NHGRI's role through document digitization, file capture, and video archiving. Okay, goal two. Uh, next, I will outline the process, still ongoing, of making these materials available to outside scholars. This includes, first, a significant database initiative, which I'll describe in some detail, and second, gathering input from outside scholars. And lastly, the History of Genomics program now has a regular seminar series, has hosted an anniversary symposium, and now conducts oral histories to augment and to capitalize upon the rich history of genomics. But I'll start with getting the NHGRI organized. All right. So. Starting in 2012, we created a process for digitizing and scanning, inventorying uh, and cataloging our history for eventual storage and retrieval. This also included a culture change of getting stuff when people leave, working with program sp uh, staff especially to find historical program files, uh, which were then, in, as Eric mentioned, in office filing cabinets, asking where historical program files really sort of describing the historical work that programs had been doing in the Human Genome Project, what had been done, um, where those could be found in uh, digital uh, form on our various shared drives, and working with analysts and with program staff to or organize program files so that they could be accessed later. So here are two really cool examples from our digitization efforts. The first is an example document from the prehistory of the HTP and of the NHGRI. So this is the first meeting of the Program Advisory Committee on the Human Genome in January 1989. I also have the agenda for the first meeting of this group, the National Advisory Council for Human Genome Research from January 1991. Um, after 80 meetings, Betty Graham is still here. <laughs> and, and the agenda is pretty much formatted in the same way. Uh, open session was shorter back then, so that is a, that is a change. Uh, next, I would like to give everyone a very quick overview of the scale and scope of the archive. So we have about one million pages of digitized paper documents. 700,000 of those pages are from directors Watson and Collins, and acting directors, such as Michael Gottesman. We also have 300,000 pages from retired staff. Retired staff include Elka Jordan, Mark Geyer, Jeff Schloss, and Jane Peterson. We also have born digital documents, which total about 25 million pages. This is the vast, vast majority of our archive. Uh, born digital means Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel documents from our various shared drives at the Institute covering extramural scientific business mostly but not exclusively after 2005. We also have an 800,000 page growth rate of born digital files per year. So this is an expanding archive. This archive is about the same size as an archive for a medium-sized research university or a medium-sized state school. So it is a significant archive. Okay. Um, we also are actively working on video and uh, audio archiving. We've uh, digitized about 300 videos so far. So there we are. Um, these include program meetings, symposium talk, TV, uh, TV presentations from folks like Francis Collins and Jim Watson. We've also digitized some documentaries and educational materials. All right, so now two brief examples checking the sound. Uh, one serious and one silly. 
or oop. Hold on. That wasn't supposed to happen. Up, up. Ah, all right, good. And there you go. All right. Using the powerful tools of the Human Genome Project, researchers at the NIH have identified for the first time a specific gene which, when misspelled in a subtle and particular way, confers a very high risk to that person of developing Parkinson's disease. So this is the Parkinson's gene identification announcement. Uh, and the second is uh, Francis in Gene Splicer. I'll stop that. <laughs> um, very importantly, all of these videos are those that either no one has or no one has in a convenient place. So much of these materials are from the 1990s, but we also have recordings from the 2000s up to the present day. So it's a pretty significant video archive. Okay. So goal two, uh, making these materials available. So as the archive grew larger and larger, it became obvious that it was extremely important to enable access to these files. And to that end, as I noted, the History of Genetics Program began thinking very seriously about the technological, logistical, and regulatory challenges of making these materials available to outside scholars. The process began in 2014 in consultation with Microsoft, uh, through which it became apparent that for our needs, building a, a SharePoint database was our best option. And it ended with a database launch in April of 2016 in a pilot phase. So next, I'd like to give you uh, the overview of our database resource that we've developed for scholarly access to our files. But first, I want to give you the distinction between the database and the archive. The archive is all of the files that we've saved, uh, including the materials that we've digitized. The database is all the files that we are hoping to eventually make available to scholars. And in consultation with program staff, we select and metadata all files in the, arc, uh, in the database and organize them so that they're keyword searchable. So as of right now, there are about 335,000 uh, files organized for the database. This is going into the database, organized for database use at some time. Uh, we have 2,500 files that are in the database right now. Uh, with plans to put in the database with metadata another thousand this year. Emphasizing that this is a very, very secure database. Uh, we worked with Microsoft and also NIH CIT to make this a secure cloud instance. The metadata is ex extremely extensive and the whole resource is browsable and searchable. Researchers have to apply to access this database and we do not include files that are in any way confidential. All right. And here's the, the top level of the database as it now stands. So examples of file categories include general HGP history, bioinformatics, mods, comparative and organismal sequencing, technology development, mapping, especially early mapping. I love early mapping. Um, human variation programs, uh, large scale sequencing, uh, and encode. And almost all these files are from before 2010. Um, the database also includes files curated and metadata in response to requests from outside researchers. If there is a specific interest from a researcher, we will curate and make those files available with metadata for that researcher in about four to six weeks' time. Okay, next, I'd like to give you a more detailed um, picture of how the database is organized. The first picture illustrates the folder substructure for materials around the HapMap project. Users can browse after finding the folder that they want. The second, uh, um, the second illustration details the database at the file level with metadata, which can be searched by keyword, which is, as you know, another way to find files. Metadata um, imputed by staff, especially for the files that are highly requested, is extensive. Um, and the reason uh, for the metadata is so that enrolled individuals can find uh, a single file instantly and with, with no problems. And often, 
these, these researchers know a lot about genomics, the HGP, but they don't know precisely about how we do business on a day-to-day -day level. So some of our nomenclature may be a little uh, unclear. So some of the metadata is a bit of an educational process for them. But uh, after uh, some back and forth between myself and the researchers, they are able to find things very, very quickly because of this very extensive, very custom metadata. So this is a map of all the uh, enrolled researchers in the database. This shows the ins all the institutions where the enrolled researchers are located. In a few cases, we have multiple individuals from one institution enrolled. It's a truly international enrollment covering Western Europe, uh, the US, the UK, Southeast Asia, and Australia. At the moment, we have 10 to 15 active researchers. And the goal of the second phase of, of the database development moving forward is to increase enrollment to 100 researchers. Um, and we certainly see that as possible in the next year. So there is high demand for this database. So to move to the other side of this engagement with scholars, not only sort of um, getting, uh, giving them access to the files that they need for their scholarly work, but also getting feedback from them. Um, we, uh, and consistent uh, with just general outreach in, in, in terms of what the program does, the program held a two-day workshop entitled Capturing the History of Genomics here at the NIH in 2015. This brought a number um, of prominent scholars in genomics and molecular biology to spend time working in the archives, to meet with program staff, and to d advise on database development efforts and the future directions for the program. Um, out of this meeting, we received a clear mandate to push forward with our database development efforts and to assist scholars in publishing work on the history of genomics. And also out of this meeting came both special issues listed on, on the next slide. All right. So both the conference and our database development have led to two issues in genetics, uh, genomics and genetics history. Special issues focusing on the history of genetics and genomics in the Journal of the History of Biology, which is on the right, um, and studies in the history and philosophy of biology and the biomedical sciences on the left, uh, which are both top journals in the field, um, will be published in late 2017 and early 2018. Also, the fact that they're sort of a little bit rivals in the field and they might be published around the same time is, is nice. Um, these, these special issues, I think, will exemplify how historians using our files are moving towards what I would call a more sort of evidence-based history of genomics and of the HGP. Um, OK. And goal three, um, as I noticed, uh, as I, as I note, uh, noted earlier, uh, the final goal of the program is to create our own history by actively hosting events, such as ongoing lecture series, as well as an anniversary symposium, and by chronicling the multiple ways the experiences of retired staff and key figures in the, gen uh, in the genomics uh, community uh, through basically developing oral histories. And our first effort in this regard is the history of molecular biology and genomics lecture series. So we've already hosted three on topics as diverse as theoretical biology and genomics, and the changing understandings of genetics and disability. And there will be three in the summer and fall months of this year. So the scholars we invite are, are typically those that we want to urge to move more definitively into writing on the history and social implications of genomics research, rather than just the history of biology or the history of Evo Devo. And to these ends, scholars visit for a few days, meet with staff, and they give a talk in the lecture series. Uh, and this provides ample time for informal discussion about the program, the history of genomics program, and its efforts. And speakers to a person have um, emerged extremely enthusiastic about the program's efforts and emphasizing its uniqueness and all the variety of things that it's done. So it's a nice coaching mechanism, but it's an also a nice engagement mechanism. So as importantly, um, in order to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the launch of the Human Genome Project, the NHGRI History Genomics Program hosted a seminar series entitled A Quarter Century After the Human Genomes Project Launch, Lessons Beyond the Base Pairs, uh, featuring HGP participants. Uh, the first six seminars featured a panel discussion involving Elka Jordan and Mark Geyer that, that uh, Eric moderated, which is shown on the right. 
Other lectures included those of Maynard Olson, Ewan Burney, Bob Cook Deegan, Mark Amara, and David Bentley. So all well-known names. And last but certainly not least, we have, uh, since 2014, actively conducted oral histories where I ask program staff, intramural investigators, and extramural grantees and leaders in the genomics field to discuss their life and work. Most are about 90 minutes long when edited for posting on Genome TV. Uh, many, like, like Maynard Olson's, are quite a bit longer. Um, we've completed 35 so far, and, and many more are planned. Um, the first set of five, uh, featuring Ewan Burney, David Bentley, Howard McLeod, and, and living legend Maynard Olson, are now on, on Genome TV on YouTube. And also included are recordings of two panel discussions with current and former NHGRI directors. So upcoming oral histories to be posted on Genome TV uh, include a recent one by George Church, which is really interesting that I did uh, not so long ago. We've also partnered with two biotech um, and basically biology history uh, organizations, the Life Sciences Foundation and the Chemical Heritage Foundation, and they've done five oral histories with us. All right. So. I'd like to play a clip of Elka Jordan, who is the, the former deputy director of the NHGRI, on the role of Bernadine Healy in the early years of the HGP. So this is one of my, my favorite quotes. She did, she did, I must grant that to her, she did recognize that this was a very valuable program and the community was behind it. And so she didn't try to kill it, which she could have tried to do. So <laughs> she, yeah, so that's, that sort of exemplifies a lot of the uh, interesting things that were going on in, uh, at around nine, 1992. And, um, so to end, I'd like to, to outline some of the key mo uh, goals moving forward. So first and foremost is to expand database content and to ensure that the database has sufficient coverage of all areas of genomics history. Um, to expand the database user base, although we're not going to need a whole lot of encouragement from this side, we're, we're sort of getting a lot of encouragement from the, from the community. Um, and uh, as much as possible, really, to improve the, the user experience inside the database, um, and especially the efficiency of the searches by keyword, uh, because it, if it has not already, it will certainly become, in a year or so, a lot to browse and search through. So we're, we're really thinking about um, basically how to, how to maximize and make most efficient searches. So to these ends, uh, in July this year, we are hosting uh, our first um, archive database users meeting, just like the users meeting of other consortium here. We will ask some of the heaviest users of our, of our database questions like, what areas do you want covered? What areas do you think we need more coverage? What do you like and dislike about file search, about the, the interface, viewing? Um, and the, the, the meeting, I think, will give us a really clear picture of how to, how to move forward with the second phase of our database design. And you know, I think it will also give us an opportunity, at least on, on this side here, to, you know, to try to move the historical community into to topics that we think are really well represented in our, in our archive holdings here and are not represented in the historiography outside. So it's sort of a push-pull. Um, so we are also going to actively court leaders in the genomics field to sit down for oral histories. Uh, so last, in September this year, we will also be hosting a handwriting lab during which uh, we will begin the tra a process of transcribing and making machine readable and searchable all of Francis Collins's handwritten notes. There are thousands of pages in our archives that have been digitized, but they can't actually be keyword searched in the moment because they're in handwriting. Um, and during this lab, we will, we will develop and implement a pipeline for the transcription process. Um, that way, I, I don't have to you know, basically interpret these notes for, for researchers. Uh, and that it's basically going to be part of, uh, it's basically part of the database. Um, so an example of this is from the prehistory of the HapMap project in 2001. And it reads, this is a medical project useful in all people, uh, not the HGDP, uh, not the Human Genome Diversity Project, which was a, an older, different effort than the HapMap focusing on the interaction between genes and cultural evolution. 
Um, I see this uh, handwriting lab that's going to come up in December, uh, uh, September, as a opportunity for graduate students. And they will not only aid us in capturing the history, but they will also be able to use these notes and these materials and their time here uh, to write their papers and their dissertations. OK, I, I need to note that the only full-time staff on this project are myself and an archivist. So it wouldn't be possible to do this without the help of many, many, many people uh, across the Institute. So Chris and I would first like to thank uh, the folks who have been closely involved in the program from the beginning. Um, and Adam and uh, Adam Felsenfeld and Lisa Brooks from Extramural, as well as Larry Brody from uh, Genomics and Society have been really uh, important in terms of guiding this program and guiding me as I'm here. Um, we also would like to uh, thank folks from the communications branch who really help with our, our oral histories and getting them on, on Genome TV. Folks in the Division of Management so that we are in full compliance with federal records laws, uh, but especially the, the core team, uh, including uh, Edson, who is our database project manager, um, and Eric. Okay. Um, thank you. Questions? So while you're thinking of questions or comments, I'm going to make a couple comments just listening to this. First thing is, um, just at a very practical level, I think and it, it was it's highly illustrative to see how far sort of our internal culture has come for capturing stuff, watching the recent retirement of Jeff Schloss sitting on this incredible historical set of documents related to $1,000 genome efforts and his major role in it, and just, you know, watching his office get um, deconstructed, but making sure nothing got lost. I mean, it was a very seamless thing. And, you know, compared to where we were, I don't know, three, four, five years ago when people like Mark Geyer and Jane Peterson retired, when we really had, we faced a similar circumstance, but it wasn't quite as easy or straightforward. So, I, you know, that was an, a great example of how we've advanced just in internal efficiencies. The other thing I'd say is I have found it to be fascinating um, to interface with the, you know, history of science field. I mean, it's a different cultural group. Some of you might have interacted with scholars over the years, but it's a, it's a very different, and Chris, is, Chris, Chris Donahue has taught me a lot about this. It's, it's they just sort of a different academic uh, environment. But nonetheless, they're extreme, as Chris as you mentioned, they're extremely enthusiastic about what we're creating. And what we, we end up doing is leveraging a lot of their energies, uh, graduate students and even some of these scholars. If we could put some minimal infrastructure together, they're the ones coming in and, and putting in the time to sift through it, to help annotate it, to do lots of things. And so I, it really is about leveraging, um, which I think has is, is proven to be very effective through some of these outreach efforts that Chris talked about. So uh, two points I want to make. How, how much of this is currently you know, machine readable? So, in terms of, uh, like, how much of it can you search? Yes. So, you can search about 400,000 files at the moment. I mean, it, it, it feels like searching the electronic record looking for particular documents. I mean, I, yeah. you know, this is, we have a capability at our place of any, anybody can just ask the question, how many records do we have that have X and Y mm -hmm. and Z? And if the number is less than five, then we don't tell them how many there are. But if the number is greater than five, we say, yeah, we have 17 records that do this or say eight. I mean, it, mm -hmm. and it feels like the technology ought to be very similar for, for you, know, you could still uh, sort of adapt our ideas. Sure. To, yeah. to we're, we're always looking to adapt. Yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I mean, the other thing, of course, is just the way they have the, the files organized. I mean, it depends if you're coming in very generically or you're coming in very specific. You're coming in very specifically, I think, did you mention the top, one of the special issues is around it's, it's about basically genetics and anthropology. But what about, was it, what's the special one you're doing on HapMap? Yeah, and there's, there's a huge effort underway on basically HapMap. So if you just take HapMap as a discrete project, you could do something similar with ENCODE, you could do something similar with a number of the, if you take HapMap, you know, even without doing searching, you have these organized folders that you could sort of build your way down. You start at the beginning or, you know, some of the earliest planning meetings, some of the, the initial yeah. set of grants, some of the earliest. Yeah. Like, yeah, well, then there's that. Right. And I mean, the, the, one, the one drawback a little bit with this number of files is I QC'd all this stuff and I organized all this stuff uh, that we basically made machine readable. So um, I know where everything is in terms of that 
that huge bank of about 400,000 files, and I can instantly tell you at least the, maybe not the floor of the house, but I can certainly tell you the address of what you're looking for. And it's basically just because I've spent all this time organizing this archive and because I have all this sort of tacit knowledge. But we are getting to a point where the, the archive is, is big enough where even that is, is starting to strain a little bit. But yeah. So I saw Eric and Val and, and Gail. Okay. Eric? First, thank Carol. you for your effort and the presentation. Uh, the sense I get, this is more of a history of genomics and less of a history of NHGRI. But I, it's I hope, both. Okay, oh. it's both. Because I remember a conversation, a fascinating conversation in this room with Mark Geyer about the early discussions of should there be a, a genome institute. Right. And and I, I hope that's captured. My second point is. Um, I hope the international flair of the Genome Project is also captured because I'm afraid in some very large initiatives today, we could use some of that and, and we seem to have lost it. Um, we're, we're not, I, in my opinion, in some of our very large efforts, we, we need to be cooperating more, particularly with the UK, than we are today. And I, I, I wasn't around during that history of how those early days of cooperation and some competition on the genome projects were born, but it would be interesting to see how that was initiated and how it came to fruition because, again, I think we could use it today. So there, there is an archiving project and history project being undertaken by the Wellcome Trust. Um, also, Beijing Genome Institute does have an effort that's, that's sort of beginning, and Henry Yang has in, in some ways started sort of sounding the alarm bells. Uh, about the international history of the Human Genome Project. Um, but uh, I do have a concern just for other country-specific efforts, whether those, those, those national flavors are being lost, although we do have some records from even the, the entries into the Human Genome Project that never quite got to be entries, uh, being the, the famous example being the, 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 the Russian or Soviet uh, entry into the Human Genome Project. We do have materials from, from, from that side, and we have country representation. But I've been sounding some bells, they're not exactly alarm bells, trying to figure out, you know, is, is France, is Germany, what's going on uh, in those countries? Um, and I sort of share your, share your, your query about it, things being lost. We're just waiting for the Russian stuff to come out on WikiLeaks. We're not doing yeah. anything about it quite We may yet. not need to wait very long. Yeah, so, so Val and... And Gail and Carol and yeah. Jim. So a couple of questions I had. Uh, one was: uh, Is there a possibility to, for a small amount of funding for like a fellows program, like a postdoc level people who might be interested in coming and working with you, and funded by NHGRI? So that's one question. The second question. Uh, regards the application, not so much the process of the application, but the principles in applying for getting access. For example, do you have to uh, propose something that's a, a genomics history? Or if, for example, uh, uh, I or someone else wanted to write a biography on, say, Eric Green, mm -hmm. could, oh, could we apply? Absolutely. But <laughs> go ahead. You can answer it now. So, so right. So, we, you know, we, uh, Claire Driscoll and I, uh, who's in our technology transfer office, developed uh, basically in a, 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 a database researcher user agreement. And basically, what you do, um, well, pr previous previous to really this year, we only invited researchers into the database who were working on these two special issues. Um, and we started very, very small. Um, and what we're thinking about, and this is still up to some debate, is, is expanding that out to a bit of a broader researcher community where you're not specifically working on a genomic special issue. But at this point, just because of the nature of some of those files, you have to be enrolled, you know, basically you have to be working as a history of science or a history professor at an institution where the institution signs for you and basically says, these files, we, 
we know that these files that you are giving us of Human Genome Project history are your property that we're just using in part of a researcher collaborator agreement, and we will not use them, you know, basically poorly and only for the stated purpose that we said, like a biography of Eric or a biography of Francis Collins or something like that. So the, it's, it's not onerous, but it is a, a very narrow series of things that, that people uh, agree to when they apply, and it's not somebody, you can't just sort of email me and say, hey, I'm, I'm just some guy um, who's interested in the history of genomics. You have to, you know, at the very least, have a very specific project in mind, and you have to be with an institution where I know that you can undertake that project, and so on and so forth. Is but the, the intention, I think part yeah. of Val's question, the intention, you know, we had to start this small, make sure we're comfortable, to all that. The intention is to grow the universe. Right. I mean, you said you have 25 over doing it, the, the, right. to grow the community as we get better at just sort of keeping a watchful eye on this. But yes, we want to, and we don't want to just have people work on stuff that we want them to work on. We right. want them to bring ideas of things that we have never thought so, of in dollars. Right. So one thing, not, not to interrupt, but one thing that we are seeing a lot of is that there are centers like in Edinburgh that do history of genomics. And I've gotten basically emails from people that I know very well saying, I have four postdocs that are really interested in the history of large-scale sequencing or the history of, you know, one example being, you know, murine, history of murine sequencing. Can you enroll all of these people into your database who are all part of this group who will collectively work on a history of, of murine sequencing? And I'm saying, yes, we can do that, and we're going to see more and more of basically these labs, basically, uh, you know, a PI plus a bunch of postdocs working on a very, very big funded project, and, and all those people under that umbrella will be enrolled into the database. So we're expanding. And then you want to quickly answer Val's question about possible trainees, which I'm sure you'd love the idea. Uh, I, would, I would love it. Yeah. That would be a, that's, we've, talk, I, yes. we've talked about it in various ways, possibly. But so far, a lot of times, folks sort of already are funded, already are part of academic programs. It's just a matter of just coming, they come here and work. Actually. Oh, yeah, but you gave him ammunition to really get after me because he's floated this idea before. So I think I have Gail, and then Carol, and then Jay, and then Sharon. Sure. Microphone. Sorry. So um, you all know Jim Watson said the, you know, LC program, ought, you know, there should be money to study unknown consequences, right? And so I was reading. Um, Laura Andrews, who some of you may know who she is, wrote in her 1999 book, quoted him as saying, I wanted a group that would talk and talk and never get anything done. <laughs> well, so the, the history of the, do, is supposed to be a laughing point, Eric. <laughs> I didn't know where you were going with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I bet, I bet he said that. Yeah. Uh, but he also said other things which were much more, and inspiring about wanting to think about social impacts. And we have lots of those quotes. So the idea, though, was just to ask you about um, your, your, your um, documents and the history of the LC program and whether and how whether people are working on that kind of thing as well, because it's a really unique program in science and policy. Mm -hmm. And so it was, I just thought you guys would enjoy a little something funny at, at 4.30 in the afternoon. Yes, it's but yeah. reviewing so, some of those notes, we find those sorts of bits and You find those the things all the time. All the okay, time. fine. Okay. Anyway, so in fact, I suspect you've got lots on the LC program. Yes. Um, so we've got lots on the LC program. Um, I could give you kind of a percentage of what the LC program is in, in, in our digitized paper files, and it's about 24%. So we also have the, the most of of Joy Boyer's files that we digitized a while back for safekeeping. Um, I also know that multiple people um, who are, all, some are at Hopkins, some are working with Susan Lindy at UPenn. Um, they are very, very interested in, in doing the history of ELSI or doing an ELSI history. Um, and also, you know, occasionally we get uh, individuals from UNC Social Medicine and Eric Youngst group. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, so that that hist I actually have Eric Young's table of contents for his history of of Elsie. Um, 
So, and we also interviewed uh, Elizabeth Thompson before she passed away. So, so LC history is extremely well represented in our archives. There are scholars that are extremely interested in, in doing um, uh, that type of work. Um, we haven't seen quite the, basically the, the coming together of a, of a very, very focused research group in my field, uh, similar to what's occurring over HapMap, also what's occurring over technology development, and also ENCODE, and also a little bit, there's the Mod Squad, they're down in Fid, uh, Sydney, they're, they do model organisms, uh, databases. Um, so I think we will see a lot of discussion of LC history in about two or three years. Carol. So kind of following what Val was saying, so I wonder uh, if you've contacted the Smithsonian, the American History Museum, for potential interns or, or, or volunteers to help with. I mean, they're, they're like our nation's archivists, so um, they might have a, a lot to offer in, in, in a project like this. So that was, that was mm -hmm. number one. Um, and the second is there's, uh, you know, the history of NHGRI in the context of genomics history. So there's a lot of history about genomics that occurred outside NHGRI, including the coining of the term genomics, right. which was coined by Tom Roderick right. of the Jackson Lab right. at Testa's restaurant in Bar Harbor, Maine. So, I, I mean, so there's probably, Tom's, Tom has unfortunately passed away, but um, his his wife probably has some of his notes. He mm -hmm. kept he kept amazing oh. notebooks, right? Which might be relevant to this, but aren't documents that come from the boxes of people leaving and retiring from NHGRI. So, is there a mechanism to get some of those documents uh, into this kind of history? So, not at this time. Um, and but I'm I'm. I'm certainly not alone, and we've been thinking about that for a really long time. So Ari Petrinos has all of his notebooks. And I go, really? And, I, and, and he says, oh, yeah, but they're in Greek. I said, well, that's no problem. I said, so, uh, so we have been thinking about, you know, there is a huge wide world of genomics outside of this institute and outside the things that we've funded. The issue is two full-time staff members and also just the, the amount of hours in the day. Um, and I think there might be a point and there might be a mechanism of where you, you know, basically looking for a repository of last resort, we may be what it is, uh, the, the, you know, basically the repository that you're looking for. No, I mean, I think we'd be receptive. I mean, we don't have an active program to graph stuff. There is practical limitations. But I think we'd be receptive, especially for an example like that. Let's keep going. Jay? Yep. I was going to, well, just one, just say I think this is Fantastic that you all have the presence of mind to do this right now and in the long view of history. I think this will pay off. Um, the I, and Maybe you had this in your presentation somewhere and I missed it, but it seems like a lot of the most interesting um, dialogues from the, you know, from a historical perspective would be not necessarily captured in printed documents, but rather uh, verbal or email. And I'm just curious about what the considerations are. I mean, imagine just all of Francis's back and forth transactions in itself, and or Jim's would it's you know so provide a, a lot of email uh, from Francis and from some other people as well. Um, we have a, a pretty um, established uh, method for if you are sort of at the division level, um, say for example Jeff Schloss, you uh, Jeff before he left basically went through his email and said, these are the historically important ones that capture the conversations that you're thinking about. Here they are. Here they go in the archive. So we have email capture. Um, and we also have, from various directors and also various staff who kept copies of their email, things like that, in a way that, that sort of capture the substratum that you're discussing. We also have a lot of, we have Arlie 2, all the videotape from that. I mean, so there's. There's sort of a lot of things that together, I think, paint a, a little more of a composite picture than what I, what I presented sort of very quickly. Does that answer your, okay. To, to the best of our ability. I mean, to the best again, of I'm our ability, comfort. right, yeah, so. Sharon? Yeah, I think I had a somewhat similar question to Carol, is that it, it would be nice, at least for the initial genome sequencing centers, to see if they have documents on their side to add to the archive, because 
you know, most of our universities are not archiving yeah. <laughs> our work. Um, and, and I would think they may have documents that are of interest that may not have showed up in your collection. Probably a lot of documents complaining about us. Yeah, <laughs> so, but. <laughs> that'd be good to hear. But they might be, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's an idea. So, so MIT does have a very extensive society, um, science and society program. And I have talked with historians at MIT. And I sort of am, am and I have been in the room with MIT archivists and MIT librarians. And that was the big alarm bell that I, that I sounded last year about basically sequencing centers uh, losing their history. But it's just, it's just not there qu quite yet. Uh, no, I mean, I meant them contributing to, us. to, us. to you. So, I mean, I, Baylor does not have such, <laughs> we don't have a lot of archiving. Um, so I'm just saying, I think it's something you might consider if some of the... Send us a CD. <laughs> well, I just meant that they, they, there might be documents yeah, that they're there willing to no, donate no, that's right. to the archive. No, I think, so I think, the, I think it's a point well taken. Maybe there could be, because that would not necessarily require a huge amount of effort. It could be the kind of thing to sensitize people. These are the kind of things, if you have, uh, you know, and you could quickly scan and send to us, we could make we could intake and make part of our archive, and we could think about it. Right. It's a good suggestion. Yeah, and but we also don't want to run afoul of their own sort of archival yeah. practices. If they them. exist. So, if yeah. they, well, Eric, they, somewhere it exists. Yeah. Eric, did you have? Eric, this, I think this is more of a question for you, yeah. and it's a bit difficult. Is it, This is an institute that has promoted public release of data. We've, we've engaged people and ask them to release their genome to the public, then why aren't we making these records publicly available and making people jump hoops and document their particular question? Just why, why aren't all of these records publicly available, or is that the long-term plan? Well, I, I think the long-term is to make as many of them available as possible. Second of all, I, make, I think this is analogous to a controlled access situation. Because uh, you know we're 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 making them available to qualified researchers. We have a fairly low bar. What a qualified, but and and then the other aspect of it is that not uh, we have to be a little bit careful. These are government records and include some information that we haven't thoroughly convinced ourselves should be publicly released, and they may never be publicly released. So to have them at least you know sort of a, have them in an archive is valuable, but but just to wholesale open everything up would potentially run into other problems. And so that's, that's why so we're trying to find a middle ground. Yeah, I've been thinking about the public face of this in regards to sort of our data release norms for five years. So it's, it's a bit, it's, it's, a, it's a struggle. Um, and I think eventually, if um, the other thing is to make these things totally public requires a differing basically public face, a differing level of metadata, I mean, it's, you know, if you want to make it searchable, you can't have the same sort of metadata that you have for just the, the, the internal database. So there's, there's some technological and logistical challenges to this as well. But the, the goal is, is to make at least some of these files publicly available so that there isn't that, that existing paradox. But I think this is an area that it's good to keep in mind and just keep pushing ourselves. Because again, we're, we look people in the eye and ask them to make their genome public and make an argument why that's good for society. And I think then, when it comes then to our own selves, we should be, follow those same ideals. I, I think the challenge with historical records in this context is that at the time that people made certain statements and wrote certain documents, they didn't know you were asking them that. So you don't have the equivalent of the informed consent. Isn't yeah, this, this a, all accessible under Freedom of Information? Uh, in, indeed, yeah, right. That's not the same right. As, but, but, well, I'm not, I'm far from an expert, but on certain things that are solicited under SOA, um, other SOIA, the subject gets a chance to comment. Things might be redacted. You might do all of that ahead of time, and there might be nothing sensitive there. I have no idea. I was just pointing out that that's the difference between asking people ahead of time and having things done retroactively. So I just wondered, uh, based on your second slide where you show all the yeah. archives or from Raiders of the Lost Ark, 
Uh, if you get, if you digitalize these, can you get rid of the paper copies? So the paper copies are all in the National Archives. So, so they're totally they all go there. We're we're totally compliant with all federal records law. So if you really want to look at the paper copy, you can go in there. Um, uh, I mean, or you can come here. It's sort of your choice. Yeah. Okay. Oh God, don't make me watch. Um, so I think we probably, uh, All right, thank Chris, you, Chris, thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. And now I have something far less appealing to offer.